Now, Tony um, has worked in her um, past and recently as a uh, um, counsellor with high conflict relationships and currently doing a PhD in the Department of Psychology at the University of Western Sydney, um, having a look at counsellor perceptions of intimate partner violence. So without further ado, Tony will give you a bit more detail on that. So I'll hand you over to her. Please welcome her up. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was a lovely introduction. I feel there's almost nothing more for the rest of us to say. Yeah. <laughs> and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming along to our presentation. Are men really victims of partner violence? I've certainly heard that question asked before. I'm pleased to be able to address that question today. I hope I'll be able to persuade any skeptics here that there are indeed men who are victims of partner violence, that there are enough of them to justify providing services for them and for their children. And there are a number of reasons why we should do that. And those reasons aren't just limited to the male victims themselves. For those of you who don't need to be convinced, then I hope that my colleagues and I will add to your knowledge and understanding of male victims today. My presentation will be focused on heterosexual victims of partner violence in particular, and my colleagues will talk to you in turn on the broader issue of male victims of family violence in general, and on the particular situation for gay men. Um, before I go any further, I want to let you know that some of the slides I'm presenting here are a little different from the ones that I submitted to the AIC to go up on their website. If for any reason I'm not able to get it up there, um, please contact me directly for a copy of the presentation if you'd like to have it. Um, throughout this presentation, I'll be trying to be consistent with my terminology. Over the years, domestic violence has become synonymous with male-perpetrated partner violence. Yet that's not the case as we know. So I prefer to use the term intimate partner violence or shortening it to partner violence because the word domestic refers to all sorts of domestic relationships, not just to the intimate partner relationship, and it shouldn't be gender specific. So I will use partner violence that would be referring to violence perpetrated by either men or women in an intimate relationship in the family. Absolutely central to what I have to say is my own professional journey through this field and how I came to be speaking here. Much like Elizabeth, I had no idea. I had the traditional education in partner violence or what was called domestic violence and that obviously was the one that said men were perpetrators, women were victims. That if men were victims, there was something that they had done to deserve it. And that if women were perpetrators, then there was a good reason for it. That they had been victimized themselves, that it was to prevent a preemptive strike um, that they were expecting in the future. And probably many of you here had that same kind of education. And as you can see, um, looking at my background here, the emphasis has been on my working with male perpetrators and female victims. That's how I started out. That's what I saw as being a helpful thing to do. So what happened? How come I changed sides, in a sense? <coughs> well, what happened was the more that I worked in that area, the more that I worked with victims, with offenders, with couples, the more I realised that that male perpetrator, female victim paradigm was only one snapshot in the collage that is intimate partner violence. And that it has many different faces. And that very often what I observed <coughs> simply did not gel with this explanation. So I had no basis with which to help people. While it seemed to be true enough some of the time, in many more cases the real picture was much more complex and contradictory. Sometimes it was a case of co-perpetration and co-victimisation. Sometimes even men were victims of controlling and coercive partners, female partners, who were willing to use violence to maintain their position. So eventually I had to acknowledge that there was no way around it. Some men are indeed genuine victims of domestic violence and partner violence. 
and many of these men have children too. I found this something of a challenge to deal with, either isolated in private practice and being fearful of making a mistake, or being in an NGO where my colleagues were entrenched in the traditional paradigm. I had my own fear of getting it wrong, of falsely identifying a perpetrator as the victim. I was warned against approaching the angry dads movement because they would brainwash me. I really needed to stay on track and on song with what I was doing. One of those representatives I was warned against is here today. <laughs> and I think you'll find that there's probably nothing terribly scary about him when you hear him speaking. Um, the children, though, were the innocent, really innocent victims of this paradigm. Every single one of those children who's dismissed because their father is dismissed could go on to much more serious, have much more serious consequences in the future. My objectives today are to hopefully put it beyond doubt for all of you that there are male victims of partner violence and in fact, there always have been male victims of partner violence. It is nothing new. They and their children are present in sufficient numbers to justify services for them. Children suffer just as much as when their mothers are the victims. And in fact, recent research shows that the consequences could even be worse for the children of male victims of domestic violence. I also want to establish that men aren't only assaulted in self-defense, or in retaliation for their own behaviour. Their female partners are violent for a whole range of reasons, just as men are. And that men do suffer a range of physical and psychological injuries that can be serious. This presentation will show evidence for victimisation of husbands by wives for hundreds of years. This is no backlash. The existence of male victims has been demonstrated in legal and literary works for centuries. This presentation will point out the massive variability in partner violence statistics, explain why this is the case, why and how contradictory and confusing pictures of partner victimisation have arisen. We'll consider why male victims have been somewhat invisible for the past 40 years, because they certainly weren't invisible in the past, in centuries gone by. I'll leave it to my male colleagues on the panel to discuss the needs of the male victims themselves. When someone raises the subject of male victims, one of the first things you might hear is that it's just a backlash against the feminist movement or against women, or that men are feeling sorry for themselves, or that it's just a bunch of irate ex-husbands whinging because they're angry with their ex-wives. But this extract you see here is from a poem that's one of many that's littered throughout English and European literary, literary history, recounting the violence of a woman towards her husband. As you see, it dates back to the 16th century. It's not only in popular literature that women's violence has been recorded. The documentation of the victimization of husbands is found back to at least the 13th century in a variety of legal, parish and community records, as well as in diaries, letters and in artworks. It is a myth that the emergence of male victims in the late 20th century is just a backlash. In fact, as Elizabeth said, it seems that men are in the position now that women victims were in 40 years ago. If you can see that image clearly, or clearly enough, it's a 13th century stone carving from an English church. It shows a man down on the ground being held down by his hair while his wife swings a cheese skimming ladle in his direction. The modern day equivalent is not rare as some of the references I've included at the end, based on hospital records, will attest. Here is a frieze from Montacute House in Somerset. The particular treatment for men who allowed themselves to be abused or beaten by their wives was specifically designed to cause them a high degree of shame by making them objects of ridicule and derision. The wife was sometimes, though not always, ridiculed along with her husband, Although today we would not agree with the reason for the ridicule, which was 
that the man was not man enough to remain charge in charge in his own household. Nonetheless, it does demonstrate that, in fact, male domination in the family home has not always been a given, and some women do dominate and control their husbands, and they will use violence to do that. Or well, they may use violence to do that. When a man was exposed as having had a beating or his wife found to be having an affair, the village people would gather outside the house of the couple, making raucous music using pots and pans and the like. Then they would drag the man out and force him to ride through the village, sitting backwards on a donkey or being carried on a long pole and forced to go through the village while they followed him, making this awful din. Sometimes his wife would be forced to ride back to back with him. This practice was called riding the skimmington, or riding the stain, or charivari, the term varying with the location. And it was designed to shame those couples who breached the social or moral mores of the day, in particular those related to spousal relationships, such as abuse and adultery. The term skimmington is derived from the name for the cheese skimming ladle that we saw in the previous slide. The first half of this frieze depicts a man holding a baby with his wife hitting him on the head with her shoe. The second half shows him being paraded through the town on a long pole, and this is what was called riding the skimmington. Throughout the history of Britain, mainland Europe, the early days of white colonization of the United States and in Scandinavia, there is extensive evidence of this practice occurring right up till the late 19th century. Although it occurred in the context of the husbands being ridiculed because they were not able to maintain their rightful position as the head of the household, a belief which I suspect few of us would have the courage to um, condone today, nonetheless what these references show is that this behaviour was common enough in past centuries. Here are just a few examples of the many records that have been found that make reference to women's use of violence against their partners. There are court records from the early 1600s describing the Skimmington. There are records from prior to the English Civil War showing anxiety over the rising violence in women. And I was struck by the similarity with the headlines we're seeing these days of rising violence in our young women in this country. There's legislation in the new colony of Massachusetts protecting both wives and husbands from domestic abuse. And in fact, there's one quote here, so turbulent and wild, both in words and actions, as he could not live with her, but in danger of his life and limb. Evidence of restraining orders against wives being issued in the late 19th century in England. There are numerous literary examples as well, recounting wife of, uh, abuse by wives and this Skimmington, writing Skimmington for husbands. Jonathan Swift, Oliver Twist, Sir Walter Scott, Ben Johnson, Samuel Pepys, Thomas Hardy, all referring to these things. And a comment that Charles Dickens gave to Mr. Bumble in Oliver Twist, when told it was his duty to control his wife, he said, the law is an ass, the law is a bachelor, obviously implying that the law didn't understand what relationships were like or at least what Mr. Bumble's relationship was like. Here we have a painting from the late 16th century, I think, <coughs> of Dawes, the henpecked husband, also riding the skimmington and wives beating him. The reason that this happened, he walked in to his bedroom and found his wife in bed with her lover. Now there's a Dr. Malcolm George in the UK who gives an excellent analysis on the social processes of denial, derision and trivialisation, which are the community's ways of avoiding the challenge of accepting the existence of men as victims of women's violence. This is something which is not consistent with our entrenched stereotypes of strong men and gentle women. And I've included some of his work in the bibliography at the end of this presentation. <coughs> 